Psychological safety means that I'm not going to experience a threat. There's no passive aggressiveness here. There's no hidden message. We have to be clear, clarity of expectations. And then you have to empathize and relate to your staff, your client. I don't know about you, but there are so many days in my business where the only way I can describe how I'm feeling is completely and utterly frazzled. The more my business grows, the more clients I have, the longer the to-do list seems to be. And trying to figure out which aspects to prioritize can some days really honestly feel quite overwhelming. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm 100% grateful for the growth of my business. But do you know what I'm talking about? It's like you're juggling more and more with less and less focus on a specific thing. And sometimes it can feel a little bit like your business is running you rather than the other way around. Well, if you're feeling that way, if you know what I'm talking about, this episode has the brain boost that you're going to need because we're diving into the power of your brilliant mind. Whether you realize it or not, your brain is the CEO of your business. It is. And just like any boss, it needs the right TLC to operate at peak performance. So my guest speaker today is Dr. Anya O'D, and she's dishing out some serious knowledge on how to supercharge your productivity and focus with some incredible brain-friendly practices. Here's what we're talking about. How understanding your brain makes you feel better at every level. We're talking about using empathy and psychological safety to motivate real lasting change. And how to step up your leadership impact and influence to support clients as well as any team members you might have. Now, once you've listened to this show, if you find this stuff as mind-blowing as I do, because I could definitely speak to Anya all day, she is honestly a powerhouse of wisdom and information. Don't keep this episode to yourself, folks. Hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and spread the word with some of your business besties. Okay, enough chatter for now. Let's welcome Dr. Anya O'Dee. Well, Anya, it's fantastic to have you joining us here on the Master Your Business podcast. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Deirdre. I am delighted to be here. Absolutely oh. delighted. Well, today, folks, you're in for a treat because we're talking to Anya about neural leadership. Now, Anya, I'm curious from a small business owner, it's a lot of solopreneurs who listen to this show, from a small business owner perspective, what is neuroleadership and why should they care? So neuroleadership is the combination of leadership practices with neuroscience. Okay. So when you think about it, our brain drives everything. It is the most powerful muscle in our body. So we've got to think about using it effectively when we're thinking about leadership. So if you kind of pull back for a second and think, well, what is leadership? Leadership is that bit of that you have to exercise influence or power over others. Okay. You have that, that requirement of you when you're in a leadership role. It also requires that you have an impact on others and you make things happen. So leaders constantly throughout the day are exposed to that and that is their responsibility. They have to be thinking in that way so that they're collectively, you know, striving forward, be it whether they're a solopreneur. If you are a solopreneur, your exercise of influence and power is often with your customer, with your client, and you need to have that influence in a positive way. So if you think that's what leadership is, so we all are leaders, whether we're a solopreneur whether we have maybe one employee or 50 employees, we're all leaders. We will just use it differently. And then when you think about the neuroscience, okay, so that is the piece that like in the last 20 years, there has been phenomenal development around understanding the human brain and how human behavior works. And then also the neurons in the brain, like we all know the phrase, you know, neurons that wire together, fire together, you know. So now when you combine all of this, we can are this is where I help people and support them in coaching is that we can think about it much smarter, much more effectively, 
to use that influence and impact to make things happen easier, that it's a happier work environment, that we make better decisions, that we use our emotional intelligence effectively. So, yeah, that's a that's a lot of talking there in the space of a minute or two. No, that's fantastic. I, I really love that. And I completely agree with you that everybody is a leader. I think so many people don't recognize themselves as leaders, but I think whether you're a mom at home and you're cooking the dinner, you're leading with the kids, or if you're coaching kids, playing football, you're a leader. But 100% agree, anybody in business, whether your title is manager, owner, founder, you're a leader if you're leading your clients. Absolutely. And, you know, you've said it so nicely, Deirdre, even thinking, outside of our work roles. We're leaders every day of the week. So to own that sense of influence and to know how to use it wisely, I think that's so powerful for people. Absolutely. And OK, so talk to me about the influence and impact piece. So I'm curious around that and and something that frightens me on you, actually, and, and this is why I want to bring this up straight off the bat, right? Mm-hmm. A little bit controversial, maybe provocative on you. Go for but it. I'm always talking about as well, let's say, in terms of neuromarketing and neuroscience around marketing, where you talk about empathy and emotions and that sort of stuff that that can be quite persuasive. And when people have that knowledge, that knowledge gives them power, but there's ethics around that power that's so fundamentally important to me. Like I have this moral compass around what's right and what's wrong. And with that influence and impact that comes back to neuroscience, what does that look like and how can leaders make sure that they're ethically right and they're not persuasive in the wrong way? Oh, Deirdre, you've tapped into a brilliant point there. OK, so that piece around like a person centred approach. So that was kind of like in the 1950s, Carl Rogers really spoke to that and using empathy to understand the other person's perspective. So be it that we talk about from a leadership perspective and marketing, anything in our daily lives. If I listen to you and or and I listen to you to understand your perspective from where you're coming from, if my ethics aren't in the right place, if I'm listening to understand how to truly just sell you something, my ethics are not really or my value is going to be that authentic, OK? And we've all been in that office with a manager where you walked in and you sat down and you had a great chat with them and they really listened to you. And then you walked out the door and you've agreed to do something and take on another project or role that you did not walk in the door expecting and you did not want to take on anything else. You walk out the door and you feel manipulated going, how how did that just happen? How did I just do that? Because the person has just used one piece. They've used one piece of like the empathy. They've listened to us. They've related to us. They've understood our perspective. And they've kind of got us on board that we've now agreed to do something. Okay. But does that mean that I will truly change my behavior? So from a marketing perspective, I might buy once off from you that I probably won't feel great about it because underneath it, I'll be like, that wasn't authentic. Yeah, that it actually, was just salesy. That yeah. was salesy and I bought it, but I've no true connection back to you. I don't feel like that person really got me. So I won't be a return customer mm-hmm. in a business. It's probably more that's a dodgy place to place all your energy on it because actually it is not going to help me to maintain sustained attention. In the moment, I might say yes, but changing behaviour involves much more than just empathy is a huge piece, psychological safety. That's like the environment we need to create. But if we rely just on that, we're not going to have behaviour change. People are not going to actually do what we want them or need them to do. 
Yeah, I love that. And I'm so glad that you've said that as well, because it's always a fear that I have where if I teach people how to do this in this way, it can have influence and impact from a marketing perspective, but it's that they use it in the right way. So come back to the leadership piece and yep. how does that how does that look, the influence and impact in terms of a leader leading clients or a leader leading people and their team? Talk to us about that. OK, so if I give you an example of a company that I would have worked with, OK, who were two years ago, they had merged and they were looking at going to a solely based electronic data management system, right, OK? for they were doing it for multiple reasons one part of the business had been doing it for over 10 years the other part of the business that they would merged hadn't been they'd been using paper files and a lot of paper-based data okay so they needed to bring both parts in alignment okay so huge change there and ways of doing it so how do you introduce how do you lead that level of change we've just merged two businesses and now how do you bring along that change so when you think of leadership and influence then, right, okay, it's great that I can tell you is my staff or team that saying, you know, look, actually, we're going to start moving to electronic files now and everything is going to be uploaded onto our system. We'll have electronic data storage, all the, it'll be seamless. It's going to be great. But one of their core values was they are really passionate about sustainability and actually paper based data, like in finance, law, any of those sectors, insurance has a phenomenal amount of documents that have to be printed, you know, stored. It's incredible. So they really want to do that from that, but also from seamless that actually you can work remotely. So to influence and have impact there, they needed to, I would have supported them to look at it in different ways of like, our goal is efficiency, greater performance, sustainability, support hybrid working. So that's all the goals that are there. That's where they want to have influence and impact. Now, how do you translate that into reality? That is where the piece around like understanding neuroscience and leadership really kicks in. How do you get people to change their behavior and move from a paper based system to an online system? and not resist change. So how do you do that? Like, how do you get people to change their behaviors? You have to come at it with several different approaches. So the first approach being exactly like what you said there, Deirdre, the piece around empathy, psychological safety relate to people. So you have to be very open and honest. Psychological safety means that I'm not going to experience a threat. There's no passive aggressiveness here. There's no hidden message. We have to be clear, clarity of expectations. And then you have to empathize and relate to your staff, your client, so that this clarity of expectations, and then that I acknowledge this is going to involve huge change for you. And this is where then the brain, the science comes back in, right? Okay. So when we want to change something, right? Okay. Our brains are set up for efficiency. That's the way, like it's a large muscle designed for efficiency, okay? So when you think about that design for efficiency, working memory is like where you take in new information really quickly and you hold it, okay? But working memory is not designed to like remember it all, okay? So you know the way like somebody gives you a piece of new information or you go shopping and you see this fabulous new skincare range okay because I'm female and I do like skincare and it's telling me this but then I have to compare it to what I have at home and go is that truly better now is that more cost efficient will that actually do everything it says on the teen okay so there's a lot of cognitive energy going on there because the working memory the whole doll area has to now compare it with the prefrontal cortex which does planning problem solving reasoning high intense energy and resources okay and we'll typically do that for short bursts okay then the other part of the brain then which is all about habits so we learn new information so you're going through you know i do my shopping in tesco okay because it's nearest 
I don't even realize that I have picked up the milk, okay? We get whole milk and lactose free milk. And they're in the shopping trolley. And I don't even remember putting them in because it's such a habit. The same as the bread and the, you know, tomatoes and avocados. They just go in, okay? So when we take in information and it's repetitive and we do it, it goes down into what we call the basal ganglia and the center of the brain, okay? And that forms a habit. So you don't actually need to think about it. It becomes automated, right, okay? So when we have to then change our behavior, and now the supermarket didn't put the milk in the same place anymore, and I can't find it. I'm checking going, but it's not on that aisle. In Tesco near me, it's always on that aisle. But in this new Tesco that I've gone to, I can't find the milk at all. It's actually way off down the back. And it's it's energy and brain draining resourcing because you have to really think. So we'll do it for short periods, but the brain loves habits and routines. Okay. So is that like cognitive dissonance then? It's creating a sort of a cognitive dissonance because our brain has to work harder to understand Absolutely. something. Absolutely. So the brain will resist it because the brain mm. is such a clever organ because it's like, I don't want to be like giving more energy away constantly. So it's like, oh, that's hard. I don't really want to do it. Yeah. And, you know, when I was working with that company, they gave me the best example of it. Like the the guy was telling me that, you know, like it recently gone and done the, to like the gym and his locker was gone. It wasn't available. And we were laughing, saying, oh, your locker, like, because it's not, you know, so we develop all these habits that prevent us from having to overthink something. They're our habit, they're our pattern. We resist change and we don't like it. Even though we might tell you we like it, we actually don't. It's hard work. So in order to get people to change and do new things, you need to understand that. And then we can now come in with, right, okay, with empathy around us. We can actually understand the environment, but then the multiple approaches back it up and strategies of like, so we start with empathy, then we need to support people to go, well, what's your motivation, Deirdre, for change? Okay. What would, why would you want to integrate that process or system or do something differently? And your motivation within the team might be slightly different to mine. Okay. But when the leader understands that, then it will help them to bring them on. Because unless I'm motivated for change, the amygdala, remember David Goldman's amazing phrase of the amygdala hijack, the amygdala kicks in immediately. And it's like fear, response, threat, don't do that, hard work, don't change, don't like this. So unless, whereas if we have motivation, the amygdala is like, oh, interesting. I think I'd like to do this, doesn't feel under threat and will actually change better. So we always want to try and have a little understanding of what's the team motivation, the individual motivation, and we'll bring people along better. So they're like core strategies that we need to think about. Then we need to think about like basic, like organizational cultural strategies. Change is different. So to actually for a to stop this bit of it all was being working memory, check with frontal lobe and compare contrast. It needs to become a habit. So you need to constantly teach people and role model. So the leader needs to role model and demonstrate, how do I do this? It's why then as the leader, you'll identify people on your team that are change makers or that are, you know, maybe very tech savvy or want to do this change so that actually they'll be the person that oh, I can go to Deirdre and ask her a question because she'll support me. The start at the end of a meeting is five minutes check in on how are we using that, guys? How's that going for you? Any problems or maybe sharing screen or on site doubling it? So we have to come at it at all these levels of like organizational, team, individual, like all the strategies have to be thought about. That's so fascinating. I love hearing about the brain, Anya. I'm like, and I can see exactly from the neuromarketing perspective where that overlap is as well uh, around that motivation, because when you tie it back from 
to that perspective, it's like it, it's what's going to drive people to take that action. And that that is part of what influence is and impact. And I suppose if we were to take it back even another level. So I've recently had Louisa Meehan on from Woodview HRM and interviewed her about how to hire your first employee. So let's imagine, you know, you're you feel like a leader for the first time, maybe in your business. Maybe you didn't realize you were a leader before. And now you have an employee, somebody that you want to contribute in a particular way. What are the sort of leadership styles that could work particularly well where it's, you know, maybe a hybrid working space? Maybe you don't work together in the same space like how can somebody make sure that their influence and impact is effective, irrespective of what that looks like? That's such a good point. So when you think about that, their influence has the impact on that it's effective, especially for solopreneurs or first employee, you want to be thinking about, well, what's their job description? What do I really need them to do on a day to day basis? OK. They does the new person understand what's required of them? How am I going to coach them through it? How, so clarity of expectations is so important. And then when you think about then from the brain bit, how did I match that with the influence then? OK, so how often am I going to meet this new employee? Do we have a Monday morning meeting that is a check in that in a way helps them to start to learn the habits of this business, that they're not constantly working off intense, high energy brain resources. How does this become a habit? So we want to build in things that we want them to do. So it'll be really important in the early stages to have lots of good open communication that is very clear about what I need you to do, how to do it. And when I expect you to take autonomy, and responsibility for that as well. It's not that I have to be constantly directing that work, but I have to tell you and inform you how to do it so that you know then how to go off, repeat, repeat. And when you can come back to me, what level of autonomy do you have? How much decisions can you make? So it's really important to think about that bit of safety and clarity as like your intro level to have influence and impact. Mm. And I'm reading a book right now, Dan Martell wrote called Buy Back Your Time. And he touches on this a little bit because he talks about transactional leadership versus transformational leadership. Yeah. And that, if you like, and I know because I worked in banking for so many years and they sent me in all these leadership courses for so many years. And it was really interesting in so many different ways to learn about leadership and, and what it looks like. But I hadn't heard of this type of comparison, transactional as in here's here's what needs to be done. Go get it done. You're checking it off and then it's the next thing to be done versus transformational, which is more like this is what done looks like. Here's there's autonomy. Go off and do whatever you want and come back to me when it's done. And then, you know, how could we do it better? So um, can you talk to us a bit around that? That's brilliant. And that is such a great example of neuroleadership coaching, right? Okay. Because the transactional is just the task based. Go do these list of tasks. Okay. Your transformative leader then is the one of here's what done looks like. So this is where we're tapping into the person's motivation. Their when we figure out something ourselves, right, and we problem solve it ourselves, the brain gets this rush of adrenaline, right? They call it like the aha moment in coaching, like that new insight, okay? And we're delighted with ourselves that we've figured it out. And we think, oh, I'm great. When you tell me what to do and you give me advice and you just direct, not always, but advice giving is to notoriously unsuccessful, okay? And we can react a little bit like a teenager of like, oh, yeah, go on, I'll do it. But it doesn't give you that adrenaline rush. So transformational leaders will really tap into that bit of here is the outcome of what we need. And that's what it looked like. How are you going to go about it? What will help you to do that? 
what you think it's required of you. So now your employee is doing all of the problem solving. They're bringing a, a, their own perspective and a fresh perspective to it. The, versus, well, I always did it this way. I was the CEO and I did it this way. So do it that way. It gives no room for autonomy and innovative thinking and for the brain to feel inspired. So we always want to be going for that transformational rather than transactional. It's really interesting, too, because from a strategic perspective, if we look for something to be created or done in a transactional way, we'll never innovate. Never. Never, never innovate. Whereas if we take that transformational approach to leadership, to our businesses, there is a much greater chance that we'll be able to develop something that's never been done before. Totally. And Deirdre, even as you say that there, when we're employing people, we want to be looking and asking those kind of questions. We need different types of brains and that diversity in organizations, right? But that bit of cognitive flexibility. So people who are typically really good innovators are often highly cognitively flexible. They can see different solutions. And they'll often maybe be a little bit impulsive as well because they'll take the chance. They're not afraid of the risk, okay? And they're great people to have on your team. Now, will they all, sometimes they will be, sometimes they won't be, but they may not always be the person who will go back and keep self-monitoring because that's the boring bit of, I have to go back and check, did I do everything I said I was going to do? Is it all done? And that's one of our executive functioning skills, the mental skills that help us to plan, problem solve, get things done. OK, so in business, if we can understand the brain skills that are required, we can look at our employees strengths and go, they are great on cognitive flexibility. They're a brilliant person on task, like looking at all the tasks and getting them done. They maybe never want to be put into that role of having to make quick decisions with a bit of risk and impulsivity. That's OK. So we want to understand people's profile and help our employees to understand their profile to go, I'm really good at this. OK, I'll try and I'll develop that, but don't put me out there doing that, you know. And that's why often small businesses, when I sm say small business, I mean anywhere between one to 25, 30, 40 employees, they'll really look at their employees' strengths to go. They will not just put people any place because there's a gap. They'll go, are they best suited there? Uh, you know, what do they need to do there? What skills do they bring? What personality traits do they bring? That's really interesting. And, you know, I, I think you're so right. And, and I love the book by Jim Collins, Go From Good to Great, because he talks about having the right people on the bus, you know, and it's the right people in the right roles, which I think is hugely important. But and, and not just from a satisfaction perspective and from a motivation perspective, but also from, you know, a practical getting results in your business perspective, it's as important there. And Something you touched on, Anya, was self-monitoring executive function and, and executive functioning skills. And what I'd love to ask you here, and this is some of some people might be better at that than others, but a lot of what that sounds like to me is self-awareness and emotional intelligence. So for anybody listening, what strategies or tips could you share with them so that they can level up their emotional intelligence and become more impactful leaders. So there is a free questionnaire, which I can send you on Deirdre and um, by Pig Dawson and Dawson and Greer. And that looks at like uh, it's a self, it's a, an executive functioning skills questionnaire. OK, so, you know what you said there about emotional intelligence and self-awareness? Mm. Absolutely. We have to have self-awareness of our own brain skills and knowing mm. what we're good at and what what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses. And you see, sometimes we think, oh, that's a strength or I'm great at it. But you might be overusing that strength and actually it's a weakness and you need mm. to up the areas that you're not. So if my stre strength is cognitive flexibility, OK, 
that's great. Like I'm always like thinking different things, but what's the impact of me on my coworkers uh, or me as the CEO? Am I constantly changing tact? Okay. What level of stress does that lead to for others? So you need to know it as have that awareness as a CEO. So I'll often do, now this is a standardized questionnaire that you actually have to be trained to be able to use it. And it's called the brief, which is the behavior rating inventory um, of executive functioning skills questionnaire. And that takes you down through all of these brain skills so that you can see where you sit with regard to cognitive regulation, emotional regulation and behavioral regulation. And then you can, that self-awareness piece then allows us to go, okay, am I better on the behavioral regulation than the cognitive regulation? Or actually there are gaps there. And then does that influence my emotional regulation? Because typically our emotional regulation will be knocked off because of our cognitive regulation. Mm, Interesting. Uh, Yeah. Tell me more. Okay, so when you think about it, like, right, okay, um, cognitive regulation involves domains of like planning, prioritizing, problem solving, task completion. Okay, so all of those brain skills, if you're now put under pressure that you have to plan and problem solve and you don't know how to do it, or maybe you're a real planner. But like this bit of problem solving, it's like it takes you a little bit longer, okay? And I now have a boss who's saying to me, "On you, can you finish that project? I need that project, that paper, you know, on my desk tomorrow. Can you finish that? I don't have time to plan that out, to actually write it out like I'd like to write it out and figure out, well, what are the best sections in this? Okay, how should I do it? That's going to cause stress, which is now impacting my emotional regulation and I can respond to that in any number of ways I can become overwhelmed and maybe just not do anything going to fight flight I might actually do it in an anxious way it's actually my thoughts are all over the place and it's not or I might just be passive aggressive and do it but not give it so our emotional regulation is constantly cognitively always regulating ourselves so Mm. go back and think of the two-year-olds in the shopping market in the supermarket they see the sweets at the till you've just finished the shopping but it's dinner time and you're not buying a packet of jellies okay (laughs) so even though you're starving yourself you're like i'm not eating a packet of sugar jellies now i'll feel awful later and i won't enjoy my dinner and it's not good for me okay so you've cognitively regulated you've done the self-talk and talked yourself out of buying the jellies Meanwhile, the two-year-old has just lit on the floor and is now having a beautiful tantrum, okay? (laughs) Because they can't cognitively regulate. That frontal lobe is not developed enough to say, you know Mm. what, wait, you know, mom, dad, whoever said, I can have a jelly after dinner. They can't use their cognitive regulation skills to support their emotional regulation. And it's the most beautiful example of emotional regulation because it's a physical like manifestation They're on the floor, kicking, screaming, screaming. I've experienced it. Yeah, <laughs> we've all seen it at some point. Now, take that into a workplace. I may not be kicking and screaming, but I'm not cognitively regulated because I'm stressed in the meeting and I feel overwhelmed. OK, so what am I doing? I mean, I'm, I'm emotionally now all over the place. So. I go back to my desk. I can't focus. I can't start. I feel overwhelmed. I feel passive aggressive. I'm often and I want to talk to somebody else because I'm like going, did you hear what he just said? Did you hear what she said? They think I can do this and I can't. So I'm basically I'm so dysregulated emotionally because I can't cognitively regulate myself. So we have to understand the different domains, kind of put all three together. Wow, that's so fascinating, Anya. I, like, I, I really think I could ask you questions about this all day long because I'd love to learn more. But um, what, I, what I'd love to hear is for, for business owners and your experience working with them, what are some of the common pitfalls that they 
tend to fall into as leaders and around their emotions, influence and impact? So probably some of the biggest pitfalls is that sense of overwhelm for themselves mm. or their employees yeah. that especially if they're on the cusp of growth, that they're thinking about taking somebody on and then they take somebody on and they're not sure what to hand over or how to hand it over. So yeah, been that, there. <laughs> yeah, that bit of knowing how to prioritize and that is where it can be so helpful to like, yeah, have a coach, but have a good peer mentor, like, you know, tap into your local mentor net networks, like for women in business, you can access free mentoring via Network Ireland Mentor Group. The Leos, they are all will have mentorship that you can tap into for free. So it's not all about the paid pieces. So how do you have a chance to to literally get that aha moment of like that you hear yourself talk about these are all the things I have to do, what I'm doing. How do you reduce the overwhelm and see actually I could hand that off? OK, so that's one thing I would say to any business owners, try and recognize are you feeling overwhelmed? If you are, how are you going to get support to change that perspective to mm. reduce the sense of overwhelm? Then other things to really think about when you want to like introduce something new with your employees or for yourself, what is going to help my brain and business to sustain this change? Mm. Because actually I'll deviate back to my habits because they're well established. So literally try and mind map it out or, you know, do a prioritization piece of like what will bring me back to keeping this going at an individual level, team level, organization. So see the outcome that you want, envisage it and then map that of all the different things that will facilitate us and map out what will stop us and recognize it so that when you start doing what you are not supposed to doing. You now go, mm, I wasn't supposed to do that, but you're aware of it. OK, so map out the challenges, the pitfalls, the triggers, really know what you want to do and what you want to achieve. And I suppose the third piece then is compassion and empathy. Have compassion for yourself as the leader and recognize what you know that you can't be brilliant at everything and compassion for your employees that they too are human so to bring that perspective with you i love that so overwhelm is a thing and i think from an overwhelm perspective something that i i say to people often from from overwhelm is actually i i believe that some amount of overwhelm is good because it means that you're stretching yourself, you're moving beyond your comfort zone. What do you think? Absolutely. And if you read any of the research around this of stress, you know, there's such stress has become so like, you know, we normalized across like social media. OK, but you want to think of um, like a little bit of overwhelmed stresses. They're good. Like we need stress. If you didn't have stress, you wouldn't get out of the bed in the morning. Because actually, <laughs> you know, you just wouldn't like right, OK, so stress is good. It's when stress starts to tip and that bit of overwhelm starts to tip. Now it's becoming counterproductive, OK, and most leaders will thrive on stress because otherwise they're at the other end of the spectrum and they're bored and a bored leader leader is not a productive leader. They now aren't getting anything done because actually they have too much time on their hands. They're way more effective when they're stressed. So it's that's that interesting. Of, mm, like I'm sure Deirdre, like we all notice this in our own lives. Do you ever see the day where you've like hardly nothing to do and you do you do nothing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have too many of those. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Sometimes I wonder if I'm a busy fool, but actually I think that comes back to your second point, which was prioritization. And I see now something I've started to do this year is I I I find when I create a to do list I'm much more productive and I'm less reactive and more proactive. 
but I break my to-do list into two categories. One is revenue generating activities and the other is non-revenue generating activities because we should all always be working on the revenue generating activities, right? Oh, I love this. I mean, this is just like, oh, I'm having a right, like, geeky moment. So what you said there, like, you know, your to-do list, okay? That now is your brain, like, optimizing its resources because it's now tapping into the planning and problem solving. So you're planning out all the things I have to do. Now you can go back and look at these two checklists and compare and contrast your problem solving, okay? Which one of these is going to generate income? Which one of these is like, if it's just me, I love reading. Give me an old paper or book any day of the week to read. Is that going to generate immediate income? No, but my brain will deviate that way going, oh, but I need more knowledge. And maybe I don't Mm -hmm. know enough about this topic. I better read a bit more Mm -hmm. versus crack on, do the job. And now you're also prioritizing. So you'll have that list, you'll write them all out, you look at them. And then because you now can see it with better clarity you go oh actually I need to do the last thing on the list and not the first thing so you're really tapping into your executive functioning skills you're planning problem solving, and prioritizing and that to-do list helps you to self-monitor did I do the things I said I was going to do did I finish them okay and that's why ultimately to-do lists are so helpful and it really helps us to understand why we have to use them versus being you know directed or dictated that we do it oh great that's good I'm on I'm doing the right you're thing you're on a winner <laughs> you're on a winner but it stops you as well using up like brain energy because otherwise what we're doing is we're task switching too often mm-hmm. and when you task switch then the brain never gets time to really pay attention and focus and you're just draining the battery it's like yeah. you'd never drive and constantly keep changing gears yeah, yeah, because you'd be like, this is so bad for the engine. I'm using up so much fuel and we task switch constantly. You know, I take a break, go down, make a cup of tea, but oh, I look at social media, you know, yes. like that is not a break. You've just task switched like, you know, oh, I'm reading this piece. Oh, I'll just go and answer that email because my email is open and binged in. It's like, actually, we need to focus on tasks and do them and finish them rather than thinking, The brain cannot multitask, but it can task switch and it just takes more energy. Yeah, that's right. And I've heard from a leadership perspective as well. If people interrupt you or if you if you switch tasks, it takes up to 17 minutes to get your focus back to the task that you're originally working on. Yeah. And that actually is the lowest level, Deirdre, from that paper that found that. Okay, the that's like the person who's most efficient okay their brain okay wow. but it can take it up to two hours okay and they looked at that like so they got people to read a paper okay and then there was three different day, like cohort groups of people so one group were reading the paper they had to answer the questions right on it okay and they did it then the second group where they were reading the paper and then they had to answer the questions in the exam as if it was an exam right and they were interrupted by text messages that they just had to read but not respond to and then the third group had to like read the paper answer their questions text messages came in and they had to respond to them and they were the ones that we were seeing that were taking up to two hours and when you think about how often there's an email being through and you go I'll just reply to that quickly If we really knew the cost that was making, we'd be like, turn that email off, close it and open it when you finish that other job. That's so important. And actually, it's interesting when I do masterclasses and things online, that's one of the things I tell people, a bit of housekeeping here, turn off all your notifications, Mm. stay focused, stay with me. And actually, there's an app that I've used for social media. One of my business mentors put me on to and it's called Opal. It works with iPhones, but I know there's other tools that work with Androids and Google devices as well. But it's really great. It blocks your social media so you can't be on it. So I've mindset from 9 a.m. in the morning to 6 p.m. I cannot be on my phone on social media. Now you can unlock it, but it gives you you have five seconds so you can ask to unlock it and you can set the time from up to one to 15 minutes in the day to have access to it. 
Um, but I found myself now when I use that, I don't go near social media a whole lot during the day. I might log on on my desktop quickly if I'm doing something, but that's it. And it's so much better to help keep focused. Because they really tapped into that brain science piece of I go, you recognize the barrier. So the barrier is that I might want to and I might try and, you know, do a default around it. And they're letting you, they're not saying you can't. But what it's doing is when you have to pause and take that five to 15 seconds to think about it, now you have to think about the consequences. And you're like, going, oh, yeah, I said I wasn't going to do this, that this might happen, that I'd want to go and just stop it, stop on you. Don't do it, you know. So in a way, that bit of knowing the barriers is so important because actually when they come up, there's a much higher chance that we won't do it. Like you'll mm. back away from it. Yeah, it's great. I find myself now I don't do it. And even when I'm on my lunch break now, or if I'm taking a break, I don't go near my phone, which is fantastic. It's really it's good because it's in those moments then that clarity and creativity arise because I'm not distracted by social media. And Anya, the last point you touched on was compassion for yourself. Let's not finish up without talking about this one, because I actually think this is probably the biggest of the three. Because I know as a business owner and as a mom who's responsible for kids and ed college education funds and and mortgages and all of those things, that yeah. there's a lot of responsibility that comes with being a business owner. And it's not easy. It's a freaking roller coaster. And some months you can have great months and other months things don't go so well. And, you know, it's not just the finance stuff. It could be team. It can be deliverables not working out. It could be customer, maybe not terribly happy or not getting the results that you want them to get. And sometimes, you know, you can be really hard on yourself. So how or what suggestions do you have for people in terms of a couple of quick things they can do to, to really stop that maybe negative inner self-talk and getting them, you know, thinking positively, looking at how can they be nicer to themselves about these things? Yeah. So there's a couple of different ways. The first bit is being aware of it, right? So when we're talking to ourselves and it's not nice then stopping ourselves and going would I talk to anybody else like this okay would I actually speak to my friend who also has a business in that way so it helps us to check in and kind of nearly counteract that negative self-talk okay that's tip one of going if this was if I was talking to Marie if I was talking to Damien what would I say to him okay and often that's a much more gentle, realistic bit, okay? So try and do it as if, how would I coach somebody else? But you're ultimately coaching yourself. Then you want to think, this is the bit about individualized recommendations, okay? So what works for me, Deirdre, might work for you. So I'm somebody that needs exercise, okay? If I don't get exercise, it really does impact my mental health. I won't sleep as well. I'm definitely much more grumpy and I'll get stressed a lot quicker. So know that actually, if you've had a hard month, check in with the bits of like going, can I get out and do a bit more exercise that's good for me, that'll actually give me a boost of all those good, happy hormones. Now, for somebody else, exercise may not be their thing at all okay and this is where you've got to sit down and spend a bit of time about thinking of what will work for you so somebody else it might be actually getting a bit of time away getting an hour in a coffee shop on their own with a good book listening to a bit of music hooking up go to the cinema with somebody meet somebody for you know if it's a business lunch or a coffee whatever it is so know the things that fill you up and often when we're stressed and overwhelmed we pull back from them and we kind of let them go a little bit. So know what really helps you to be compassionate to yourself. And then record when you are in that place that you're not feeling great, that we can draw on those resources. That's so interesting because I see myself do those things sometimes as in I pull back from the things that I know fill me up, like riding my horse, for example. And I see myself doing that and I call that self-sabotage, rightly or wrongly. Um, but I, I recognize that because I know when I'm riding my horse that I'm like 
I just feel so powerful and in control of this three quarter of a ton animal. And, you know, he's fabulous, but making him do certain things or move in a certain way or go at a certain speed or, you know, it feels really powerful. And you have to be so present that that's my, that's how I fill my cup. But I 100% recognize myself when I'm, I, if I'm feeling stressed or overwhelmed or busy, like I don't, I self-sabotage by not doing it. Why, why might that be on you? <laughs> it, it might be because yes, it is a real preferred activity that you love doing, but is it a habit? Like, do you ha- do it every single day? Do you no. have it, you see? So when mm. it's not a habit, then it, the brain has to think about it and it needs more mm. energy. And if I'm stressed and feeling really crap about the week I've had, it's harder for the brain to now initiate new things because it needs a bit of energy. You have to get yourself together. I was talking to somebody recently and they said to me that they'd had a heart condition years ago and they were told very clearly, you need to walk every day. So -hmm. this person told me, was telling me like, oh yeah, that she now goes for a walk every single day. Every single day she'll get out for a walk. Because she has to, but she's been doing it for 20 years. Wow. And when she told me this, I was like, my reaction was the same. It's like, wow. I was like, that is incredible. Because she was telling me about like how she has so many ideas and like, but they're all when she's out for a walk. Mm-hmm. They're not. But it's a habit. And for many of us, we we don't have that self-care habit. And self-care is not about like buying something for yourself. It's about the pragmatics of mental fitness. You will become much more self-compassionate when you're engaged in something that brings joy, like Mm -hmm. being on your horse, like painting, like exercising, because the brain is no longer thinking about all those negative things. It's focusing its energy on the activity of Mm -hmm. horse riding, walking, exercising, talking, whatever it is. And distraction is a real, like, distraction is a key form of emotional regulation. Mm, It's interesting. And one of the reasons that I'm reading that book, Buy Back Your Time, right now, is so that I can create habits that help me regulate my time so I can create a habit where I have time to ride my horse. And already, I'm only a few chapters in, folks, at this stage, but already... I can see the difference it's making in my time by, you know, and and probably I was good at this because I would have had training on this over the years mm. when I worked in the bank, but I just fell off the wagon in terms of managing myself and my time. And already I can feel the difference. My energy is up and, you know, I exercise most days anyway, but that time for my horse and creating the space for myself to do it, I'm excited. I can't wait to see what comes. And Deirdre, it's so true. We'll all fall off the wagon, like in another a few months and two years time. But it's how do we pull ourselves back on again? Mm-hmm. Mm. Anya, you are so knowledgeable and informative. Mm. And I could honestly ask you questions all day, but we need to wrap up the conversation. So any final thoughts or tidbits you'd like to share with anyone? I think it's that bit of like, whether as you said at the start, that you're a mom, a solopreneur, a CEO, try and think about going about it in a brain friendly way. Use your influence for yourself, the impact that you want in your life and try and do that in a brain friendly way. So thinking about how you plan, problem solve, prioritize, regulate your emotions physically and mentally. And that will help you to do the things that you need to do and get them done. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Anya, I'm going to share that questionnaire that you mentioned in the show notes so people can check it out. And it will be um, over on the, the blog as well. And also, I will share links so that if anybody wants to reach out to Anya, that they can find you by your website and social media. And Anya, you work with? Radiance Consulting. That Radiance Consulting. The company. Absolutely. And th- who are the types of clients that you work with, Anya? Mainly leaders who are new to a leadership role and feeling maybe a little bit overwhelmed, stress, or people who are well established in business 
and they need to introduce change. They're going for growth and transform and also leaders who want to get a new perspective into what they're doing and why they're doing it and to get the best out of themselves and their team. Fantastic. Well, Anya, it's been an absolute hoot and pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you so much, Deirdre. It's been a great, great chat. Thank you. Whoa, that was a bit of a mind bender, wasn't it? So, so interesting to learn about our brains. And Anya dropped so many actionable nuggets to help us regain control of our brains. And that means that we regain control over our businesses as well. And I thought it was really interesting too how so much of the neuro leadership stuff ties in with a lot of the neuro marketing stuff that I talk about as well. And it's all connected when you're showing up online with your social media stuff, you know, taking that neuro leadership approach and putting yourself into your client's shoes, really being empathic, it helps you create messaging that's going to land so much better as well. So Anya mentioned that there is a questionnaire available. You will be able to find that in the show notes and on the blog. So go to the show notes, check it out and have a look at that executive functioning skills questionnaire and see how you come out. It's going to be so interesting. I can't wait to do it. And remember, you ambitious entrepreneur, your brain is the ultimate powerhouse. When you fuel it right and give it the space to shine, you're going to be amazed at what you can accomplish So I'd love to hear what is your biggest takeaway from this episode and how are you going to put some of this amazing science into action for yourself and your business? Tell me, share your thoughts over on LinkedIn or on Instagram and tag me on your post. I'd love to hear what you thought. And as I said earlier, if you enjoyed this chat as much as I did, give the show a rating, leave a review and tell your entrepreneurial besties all about it. Either way, until next time, Keep mastering your business. Bye for now.